Jay Leno put it best the other night. He said, we've got now federal employees are going to be running airport security. So not only are they incompetent, but you can't fire them. <laughs> How is that going to work? How is that going to get us more airport security? No one laid out how. In fact, the Democrats pitched it as, this is so important, we want the federal government to run it. The obvious comeback for Bush would have been to give the Federal Express, Postal Express, po po overnight U.S. Postal Express type comparison, and he didn't do it. And so the Democrats won by, by pitching the issue in a way that, you know, it's important. If, it, if it's important, well, then, of course, the government should run it. But there was no comeback. And that means the people who are going to be running, and think about the difference. First of all, I want to note something that has been undernoted. You know, everyone's been pointing to the, with Argonbright, and that's one of the security firms, and other firms that are running, that have been running uh, airport security and how they're paying low wages and they have high turnover and the, it's a move up to work at uh, Cinnabon and so on. <laughs> but interestingly, the thing that happened on September 11th wasn't due to anyone making a mistake. The things that got through were completely legal. So, yes, you could point to incompetence many times. There were people who got guns through in the past. But the point is, what they did not did was completely consistent with the rules they were supposed to follow. So it was the rules that were wrong. It wasn't the enforcers. And so what do we get? And by the way, notice that the airlines who were hiring these people had some trade-off they had to make between security and speed, security and convenience. If the airline hassled you too much, you miss your flight, and then they're in trouble. But if the federal government is running it and you miss your flight, tough. Too bad. That's, that's not their concern. And that's what we're going to be facing fairly soon. Also notice, by the way, we're going to be facing that from the same organization that still thinks it's important to tell us how to fasten a seatbelt. I remember there used to be an airline around here called Morris Air, which was bought out later by Southwest, I believe. And I remember flying Morris Air from, uh, from uh, San Jose to Phoenix, I believe, and the woman coming on and saying, for those of you who don't know how to fasten a seatbelt, which means those of you who haven't been in a car since, oh, about 1962, I mean, that's the point. They have these crazy rules. Or the other one, has anyone unknown to you asked you to carry something? Have you been away from your bag? You know, all these things. These are the things they think of as important. I don't see how we've solved anything. I think we've added a huge problem. Moreover, I was giving a talk on this in Washington about six weeks ago, and I was telling some of these same stories. And someone, uh, Chris DeMuth, the head of the American Enterprise Institute, told a story. He said that, Delta Airlines, about two days after September 11th, had noticed their bookings going way down and were seeing their airline at risk and came up with a plan. And they had a whole advertising. They started thinking of, through an advertising campaign, you know, fly with us and you're safe. And they called up the FAA and said, you know, we want permission to have retired FBI agents carrying guns. And the FAA said, no, you can't. So not only are they not going to do a good job of providing security, they're actively preventing the airlines from providing security. Interestingly, by the way, Europe has many private airports. Maggie Thatcher denationalized 17 of them. And there's a whole lot more of a private role in security in England. One of the things that I learned from, uh, well, I put together in my second chapter a list of 10 what I came to call pillars of economic wisdom. And at the start of every course, I always lay out these pillars and go through various examples of them. And I won't go through all of them here, but there's one that um, I want to point out, and that is what's sometimes called the law of unintended consequences. When you do something in order to achieve a certain end, you may achieve that end. You also necessarily achieve other ends some of which might not be your purpose, and sometimes it's so perverse that you achieve the opposite of your end. And we see that with many government policies. The example I give in the, in the book is, the, uh, is how Ralph Nader essentially created the SUV. 
<laughs> Ralph Nader, and I got to give credit to where it's due, Ralph Nader and Gerald Ford. <laughs> Gerald Ford pushed something called, or signed into law, something called the CAFE law, corporate average fuel economy, that required that auto companies achieve a certain number of miles per gallon on their whole fleet year and had a separate small uh, lower requirement for trucks. That was what economists call a binding constraint. In other words, it kept that average higher than the market would have yielded, especially when it was passed at, the, at a time of very high oil prices, and then, of course, oil prices started dropping. So people wanted the bigger cars. This was one of my issues during, uh, I, I should go back. Nixon gets some credit here, too. Why did we have this big problem? It was because there were these price controls that Nixon imposed on August 5th, 19, 15th, 1971 that caused shortages throughout the economy. When the OPEC price increase hit in the fall of 1973, prices were not allowed to go up at the retail level, so we had shortages of gasoline, people sometimes murdering to get gas. There were a number of killings at the time. And that was, and so people were trying to get more gas than was available. You could, the government could have responded by just getting rid of price controls. They didn't do that. Instead, they said, look at how wasteful people are. Huh. We're keeping the price artificially low, and people are acting as if we're keeping the price artificially low. <laughs> what pigs? And in fact, some of Carter's officials, Jimmy Carter's officials, later on called us energy pigs. Well... So if they're going to do that, then the next call is for all kinds of regulations to prevent us from using so much fuel, and the CAFE regulations were part of it. Well, this was one of my issues when I was the energy economist at the Council of Economic Advisors under Reagan in the early, early 1980s, CAFE laws, and I wanted to get rid of them. What I noticed was that station wagons were disappearing. And I wrote an article, and it's obvious why, because they get less fuel economy and they were bringing down the average too much. And I wrote an article about this after I left the council. You're a lot more restricted in what you can write about when you're there, which is one of the big negatives of the job. You forget how to, how to write. To, well, no, you, you learn how to write quickly, memos, but you, you, you forget how to write to a general audience. So I wrote an article about this laying out how the station wagon would, was disappearing and would disappear, and also pointing out that it also explained why small truck sales were rising dramatically because the tr small truck average is 21, the, the car average was 27.5 miles per gallon. What I did not anticipate, but should have, is the creativity of Detroit because Detroit said, hmm, we want something that fits as a truck but kind of looks like a station wagon, thus the SUV. Now, how does Ralph Nader get in this? Well, I have a a little segment in the book where I, ha I lay out, I had an a hour and a half long interview with Ralph Nader that was really about an hour and 25 minute long argument <laughs> after, after the niceties. And what I was trying to get, here's some other background. How do you make, how do you get a car to fit within the cafe laws? You make it lighter. But when you make it lighter, it becomes less safe. An economist at Harvard and Brookings Institution found that the CAFE laws in the model year 89 would cause about 2,000 extra deaths a year. In other words, two-thirds of a World Trade Center every year. And I was basically trying to get Ralph Nader to admit that in the trade-off between regulation and safety, he'd chosen regulation. And he wasn't going to go there. But it was fun trying. <laughs> and in a way, his, his associate, Clarence Ditlow of the Center for Auto Safety, did go there. He said, you're never going to get me to admit that. Well, it's kind of like admitting it. <laughs> One of the, my big heroes, and I talk about a bit, a bit in my book, is Friedrich Hayek. And I had an article in the Wall Street Journal in October when the Nobel Prizes were awarded because they were all given to people who worked on information. And I point out, although you could argue that two out of the three of them deserve the Nobel Prize, they, they did work on asymmetric information, but I think they missed the most important asymmetry. It, it, and the most important asymmetry information is between decentralized information held by participants in the market and centralized information held by government. Look back at September 11th and think about the one thing that went right on that horrible day. It was Flight 93. It was people with their cell phones responding in a decentralized way to decentralized information they knew 
what would happen if they didn't take over the plane? And that changed, that, as you said, that changed it all, that, cha- that suddenly the stakes were different. And so if we, if the government had done nothing on airport security after September 11th, we would have been safer than we were, than, than, than before. Now, in fact, they could have even gone further, and that is deregulated. Let that be an issue for the airlines to choose. Do they allow pilots to carry guns or not? There was a hijack, attempted hijacking in the 1950s that a pilot, a, a pilot shot the hijacker dead in the, in the United States and ended the hijacking. So, so those, those are options. And uh, now, I don't think that – I'm not saying the federal government should require that airlines – let their pilot have their pilots carry guns. I say airlines have strong incentives to make good decisions about that. Let them ha- choose, and there'll be different choices. I want to point out one other thing. When I was watching C-SPAN the other day, and it's unbiased. Uh, but, uh, uh, they, uh, one, one senator was saying, we've got to have uniform standards at airports for security. I thought, does this guy ever play poker? <laughs> Uniform standards, which means once you figure them out, you know how to do it anywhere. What you want is changing standards that aren't predictable. And that's what we would get with private airports, with private airlines, and so on. 